Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and happy Tuesday. My name is Kevin Burns. I'm the mayor of Geneva, and I'm proud to serve as the chairman of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus Environment and Energy Committee, and especially proud to welcome you to today's discussion. Uh, we are talking about, ready for this, folks? We're talking about salt management and the appropriate and best practices with respect to our communities, how to tackle those dicey winter or the, the winter season with our professional staff and of course, in terms of our environmental consciousness. Uh, we have an extraordinary panel with us today. I am particularly proud that some of our, my colleagues from Geneva are with us. Uh, Geneva takes this issue very seriously and we have uh, implemented all sorts of programs over the last few years, including some of the snow fighter best management practices in terms of our purchasing of products for fighting ice and snow and what have you in the city of Geneva. I know we're gonna learn a lot more today, so it's gonna be wonderful. With that, I wanna begin with a very special guest. Uh, he is the president of the DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group, the Conservation Foundation. I wanna to welcome to the call, David Gorman. David, welcome, good morning. Morning, Mayor Burns, thanks for having me. And I'm always uh, glad to attend our meetings here with the Environmental Committee. Um, I've been serving as the president of the DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group um, since 2012. And we formed as a nonprofit organization in, in 2005 by municipalities, wastewater agencies, environmental, environmental groups, and professional firms in DuPage, Cook, and Will Counties. Um, the Clean Water Act, through permits issued by the EPA, covering wastewater and stormwater requires improvements for aquatic life. Now we've ex extensively covered our waterways, studying them, and now we're implementing cost-effective projects and programs uh, as required by our permits. In addition to physical projects, the members of the DRSCW have improved uh, programs such as snow and ice management to safely and more cost-effectively serve the public's need for safe streets and facilities while minimizing the environmental impact of salt into our waterways. As with everything that public agencies do, we have a triple bottom line of social, financial, and environmental impacts. Uh, Stephen McCracken is our talented and dedicated director. I greatly appreciate his time with us today, as well as Wilf, Jason, and Hannah. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Um, I am. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. So um, Dave's already covered uh, how this organization got involved in the uh, snow and ice um, business. And that was approximately 15 years ago. And, and it was ordered to offset uh, micromanagement from state and federal levels. We felt that those decisions were better made at, at the local level and we could do it in a more cost-effective uh, manner. So one of the first things that we set out to do was to check that when we were told that our waterways were out of compliance with state law in terms of the uh, concentration of salts in them was that we uh, set about analyzing why that was. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a graphic uh, showing a um, salt concentrations in the river system in um, between September and December or March uh, of uh, for eight years. And um, a couple of things to draw your attention to here. This graph is for chloride. Chlorides, we'll be using that word interchangeably with salt. It is, of course, the active ingredient of our winter de-icing compounds. Um, and um, those two words tend to get mixed together. But essentially, you hear chloride, think, think, think one of the salts that we're using for uh, winter de-icing. The other thing is this is estimated. We use uh, electrical conductivity to collect this data, but to all intents and purposes, very accurate. So it, uh, it's essentially the same as if we were doing high, you know, a, thousands of grabs of, of salt concentration. Just gives us a better resolution image. So uh, last thing to gather from this um, graphic is this red line, which is the state water quality standard for Illinois, uh, which for chloride salt is 500 milligrams uh, per liter. Um, so Following that line across, you can see that once we, as we move from left to right, once we hit December, we typically have our first call out. We start to apply our salt to the road surface, dissolves, and then we get these. Um, we're, we're pretty much above the water quality standard for the rest of the winter. And then it tails off as we move 
March uh, into April. Uh, here's another view of what water bodies look like um, uh, over years with chloride. This is a lake. This is Lake Michigan. Um, and um, before I go into what the graphic shows, I just want to, to lay any fears that even given this pretty steep trend, that lake has, you know, be hundreds of years at this rate before that lake became uh, undrinkable. So it's not an immediate problem. What I just wanted to demonstrate here was that the amount of salt that we're using is capable of affecting the concentrations on an ongoing basis for a, 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 a body of water as massive uh, as that lake. Um, we're also finding, of course, chlorides have been accumulating in our drinking water wells. And, and all of this is um, uh, sort of enhanced by the fact that chloride, like a lot of the other pollutants that we work with, does not break down in the environment. It's, it's, it's quite inert. It doesn't break down under solar radiation, biological activity, mechanical action, anything like that. So once we introduce chlorides into the environment via our snow and ice operations, um, they're essentially there uh, indefinitely. The final place it's worth noticing that we're finding uh, chlorides is popping up in our wastewater uh, streams. So this is um, data from 2016 to 21 for the West Chicago Winfield uh, wastewater Authority. And you can see the summer concentrations are in blue and the winter in orange. And I want you to look at 2019, um, where you can see there that where we did, in fact, go above the state water quality standard of 500, which is on our uh, y-axis um, in, in 2019. Now, the state wanted to put a chloride limit onto this wastewater treatment plant um, because, of, uh, because of this. Um, we were able to argue that um, way pointing out the fact that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really wastewater. What you were having here was stormwater coming in from our parking lots and roads, infiltrating into the storm system, and then getting into the, the, uh, the sewer, um, sewer system and then arriving at the, uh, the plant. Um, and, and of course, you know, to try to clean this out of the plant is ridiculously expensive. It's a desalination system. Uh, so we were successfully argued that way, but it does point to the fact that we are going to see this increasingly creeping into um, our uh, you know, our permits, um, both um, the permit I'm about to review, but also things like our development permits, where we've had some uh, private contractors contract us about that they couldn't construct parking lots, et cetera, because they were going to be introducing more salt into the waterways. The principal permit that um, everyone on the call is uh, would be dealing with is this ILR 40 or the MPDA stormwater permit. I'm not going to belabor it, but just point out that in 2000. 15, 16, it was rewritten and chlorides were the principal pollutant that it set out to deal with. There's a lot of other information in there, but chlorides really move into the, uh, the, the center stage at that point. And that permit is typically that's issued to municipalities that have a separate storm system. So I did say we've been working on this for 15 years. And so hopefully, you know, we can show that we have made some progress. So what you're looking at here, uh, this is a simplified graphic looking at chloride concentrations in the waterway. Um, once again, this is Salt Creek, the same graph that we looked at earlier. Um, but in this particular case, we've, we've teased out you know, these various um, averages and uh, 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 daily maximums. And so what we're looking for is a downward trend. Now, the first thing you notice is it's very messy. There's a lot of bouncing around winter to winter. And that's because of the, uh, the, the inconsistencies of winter weather. We don't get a standard winter. It, it tends longer, shorter, a lot more ice storms, et cetera. All of those drive the amount of uh, de-icing compounds that we use. But there is definitely a downward trend in concentration that we are detecting, which suggests that we're making uh, forward progress. So there is hope out there. And obviously, uh, Dr. Nixon and Jason uh, from Carroll Stream will be um, uh, talking about what kind of activities we put in place to try to capture this downward trend. And with that, I think I'm on time. I would take uh, any, any questions. You are on time. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> I practiced it. Yeah, very impressive. Very impressive. We have, we, uh, Cheryl, I know, is going to be monitoring the chat. Uh, Cheryl, if there's something pertinent, just obviously chime in. Otherwise, with no objection, we'll continue on with. Uh, I do not. No. OK. Dr. Nixon. Dr. Wilford Nixon, ladies and gentlemen, has more than 30 years of experience conducting research and providing training and information about winter maintenance best practices, including plow and cutting edge performance, 
optimal chemical usage, snow fence design, plow and truck instrumentation, novel technologies and information management and decision making in winter maintenance. The author of more than 100 papers and reports, he previously worked with the SALT Institute and served on the engineering faculty at the University of Iowa and Dartmouth College. He holds both a PhD and bachelor's degree in engineering from the University of Cambridge. And when Dr. Nixon was conducting research into the winter maintenance at the University of Iowa, his ice labs were known, of course, as the coolest place on campus. Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Iowa City, Iowa, please welcome Dr. Wilfred Nixon. Thank you so much, um, Mayor Burns. I really appreciate that uh, welcome. Uh, very kind of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, going to talk and follow on from what um, Stephen has said about how what we do in winter maintenance can impact the amount of salt that we use. And what I'm going to focus on is levels of service. And then we'll follow that up with Jason from Carol Stream. He's going to talk about some of the techniques and uh, methods they're using to minimize their salt use. But let's be very clear as we dive into this, every bit of salt that comes out the back of our trucks is now in the environment. And it's our job to make sure that we get the very best out of each grain of salt. Um, you know, we can do that, of course, by talking to them individually and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, we, we might <laughs> want to see if we can find some other ways of doing that. So I'm going to look at levels of service, why they're important, how they impact salt use, and how can we adjust them to better control our salt use. And, you know, obviously for that, we need to understand a little bit about what they are and what they do. Um, and let's ask a question here, and this is gonna be something that I think Jason will get into. Suppose we leave our levels of service as they are now. Can we really use less salt and get to those same levels of service? And there are a bunch of good practices out there that allow us to do that. So uh, there are plenty of solutions. The challenge is going to be which ones are right for your community. And I do want to make it very clear right at the beginning, this is not a one size fits all solution. Every community has different factors they have to take into account. And because of that, their solutions will differ. Okay, so what are levels of service? When the snow starts to fall or even before it starts to fall, we have goals, we have things we want to achieve. And the way I've always thought of our level of service goals is if we don't know where we're going, we'll end up somewhere else. We have to have very clear goals so that we know what we're trying to achieve when we send the plows out or whatever it may be that we're doing. They can be visual, they can be verbal, they can be a mixture of both. They need to be clearly specified. In the ideal, every single street and road and parking lot and sidewalk has a specified level of service that anyone in your organization, including your public, can see and understand what you are trying to do. They need to be measured and they need to mark an end point. Folks who do winter maintenance are often motivated by a strong drive towards public safety and to a lesser degree mobility, but they want to make sure the people on the streets they take care of, what they consider to be their streets are safe. And that leads to, I won't call it a problem, it's an issue. You get to the level of service, whatever that may be, maybe it's bare paper. And you say, well, we'll just do one more shot of salt just to make sure. And that one more shot of salt doesn't actually do anything. If you get to the end of the storm and you can still see salt on the road or the sidewalk, 
it's been wasted. It was not needed to achieve your level of service goals. That can be our very first indication that we are over applying. And let's be honest, we've all seen that. We've all walked on sidewalks where there was a gentle crunch underneath our, our feet as we went along because we're walking on excess salt on that sidewalk. We've all seen at the end of a storm, the salt on the road that didn't go into solution, didn't do the job that we needed it to do. So <clears throat> level of service is really saying, here's what's acceptable in our community. Couple of photos here. One, obviously on the left there, that parking lot, it's kind of covered in snow and ice, like most of the cars. And I think most of us would say, no, that's not acceptable. What about the road shown on the right-hand side there? Uh, we can see bare wheel tracks. It's obviously, it's still snowing at the time, but is that road okay? Or is that road okay for in the middle of a storm, but boy, it better be cleaner than that once we get the storm finish. And really that's what level of service is about. What is okay for my community at the end of a storm or sometime after the end of a storm. And it's really very important because winter maintenance is, it's complicated. Uh, anyone who's done it, anyone who's looked at it, understands there are all sorts of bits and pieces going on and everything that we do or we don't do impacts everything else we might do or we might not do all of which gets a little bit daunting. How do you break it down? How do you decide what you should do? Well, my background is in engineering as, as um, you, know, you, you heard. And so when in doubt, I draw a diagram. And you'll see on the right-hand side of this diagram, there's that little box that says levels of service. And our materials usage and our equipment selection and operations feed into that. And coming out of that, is performance measurement and hopefully continuous improvement. Also involved are uh, uh, strategic operations. That's going to tell us, you know, are we buying new trucks? Are we using liquids? And our tactical operations, what are we going to do in this storm? How much salt are we going to put down today when it snows versus what we put down last week when in a different circumstance, it snowed? There's a lot going on here. I don't want to give you the impression that all you've got to do is decide on your levels of service and that's it, it's done. You'll hear again from Jason coming up in a minute, there's a lot going on. There are lots of cogs and wheels in all of this happening. Let's look at a couple of examples. I, I talked about a visual and a verbal. This is a verbal example, okay? This is what they use up and around uh, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And you'll see, first of all, they've classified their different roads. It's not every road gets the same treatment. Although for every road, the goal is what they call their lane. And they've got a very detailed description of that. They've broken their roads down according to how much traffic is on them. That's the AADT, average annual daily traffic. And you'll see their super commuters, more than 30,000 a day. They want those to get to a bare lane condition one to three hours after the end of a storm. You'll go all the way down to their secondary roads, under 800 vehicles a day. They give themselves nine to 36 hours after the end of a storm. And you can see as well in that bare lane description, they're pretty specific. All the driving lanes are free of snow and ice between the outer edges of the wheel paths. And while you can have snow between those two driving lanes, it can't be more than an inch of accumulation. They then have this thing right at the bottom, which I, you know, I thought they were doing quite well up till there, but then they say loss of bare pavement is when 5% or more of the pavement is slippery, icy, or snow covered. I defy any of us, myself included, to look at a photo and tell you if it's 5% covered, 10% covered, 20% covered. That's really difficult to do. But on the other hand, up till then, they were doing pretty well. It's specific. 
and that's important. Here's another example. Uh, this is from where I live, which is in Iowa City. Um, and if you look at the photograph on the top left, we're looking straight ahead down a residential street. And you can see on that residential street, there's still snow and ice present pretty much in places all the way across the street. Now, this was 24 hours after the end of a snowstorm that dropped about four and a half inches on Iowa City. It was a February storm, so it was relatively cold um, and it didn't warm up afterwards. So there was still snow and ice on the road. And for us in Iowa City on a residential street, that's okay. You go across to the top right, that's a collector, okay? It's, if you will, the next level up. And you can see, yeah, there's snow in the middle of the road. There's actually snow between the wheel paths. Not very much, but for us, we can get around on that, that's okay. You go down bottom left, that's an arterial. There is snow on the shoulders. You can maybe see in that left turn lane, there's a little bit of snow there, but otherwise it's clear. And then the bottom right, that's not actually one of the Iowa City streets, it's Interstate 80, it goes just through the north edge of town. And you can see that's, that's bare and dry and, and while I wouldn't recommend it, you could probably eat your dinner off it. Um, okay, it would probably not be wise though, but that's a visual way of expressing level of service. Now, there are other ways you can do this and different agencies have different ways of putting it all together. What's important to understand though, it is hugely location specific. And we do need to understand what works for you wouldn't work in Georgia, wouldn't necessarily work in Iowa, wouldn't work in Colorado. I'll give you a specific example. You know what your levels of service are. In Iowa City, ours are probably a little bit different from those. I have a good friend who looks after the, the streets out in Fort Collins, Colorado. And they, for residential streets, they don't plow or do anything on their residential streets unless and until they have at least six inches of snow. Now, what do you think would happen on your streets or on mine if we allowed six inches of snow to build up? There? Wouldn't be good, right? You could hear the howling um, probably all the way on the East Coast. Why is it so different in Colorado? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, that's what people are used to there. Whereas in Iowa City, we're used to what we have and in your cities, you're used to what you have. So the familiar is what we work with. The second thing though is the climate. In Colorado, a typical winter storm comes in one day and then the following day, it's clear, they're up somewhere around about 4,000 feet. Uh, you've got sunshine, the temperature, the air temperature is going to get up to 50 degrees, no trouble. That snow literally burns off. It doesn't even bother melting. It just goes straight into evaporation because it's so dry. There. So no, we don't need the same levels of service in Colorado, in Illinois, in Iowa, in Georgia. Everywhere should be different. They should be road type specific. I would say, and I, I think this is understood as being best practice across the country, residential streets do not have to look the same as interstates when all is said and done, okay? We can accept differences between those. We also might want to think in terms of time of day uh, specific. If we have a storm, that is going to end maybe four hours before the uh, rush hour kicks in. Under those circumstances, I would say operationally, I'm gonna put everything I have on my major roads and my residential streets are gonna receive much less attention, even though my normal level of service might say, oh, they'd be in better shape now, no. I've got to focus on my major commuter routes. Otherwise, I'm going to be in deep trouble. So it's, it's 
First of all, it's very location specific. What works for you may not work for anybody else, may not work for your neighboring town. There could be different expectations. Here's a, a wonderful example. I love this. This is from Larimer County in Colorado, and it's an appalling road sign. Um, the road sign, yeah, this is a level five road. That's okay. That probably conforms with the manual of uniform traffic control devices, but all the rest of it, way too small. Nonetheless, they have it there and it spells out in detail what the six levels of service are that they provide. It's a level five road and you may be able to see level five roads or those county roads which will be plowed and or sanded only after the needs of level one through level four roads have been made and resources are available to open these roads. That gives me as a road user a pretty good idea of what I can expect on that road. It's gonna be sort of nothing until we have some spare stuff we can do. Now you may or may not be able to read level six. Level six, it says basically, no, nah, we're not gonna plow them, but we promise to come and look for your body in the spring. So this is pretty, focused, it lets people know what's going on. Would it work in your area? Probably not. Okay, but at least they've defined exactly what they're going to be doing, and that's good. So what are we trying to do? Well, we want to achieve our desired level of service in a timely manner, okay? We may have time statements in there, like that first written one did, one to three hours, two to five, nine to 36 hours after the end of a storm with an appropriate use of resources and materials. How many people are we gonna have doing this? How much salt are we gonna put down onto the road? And then the final thing, taking into account the severity of the storm conditions that we're facing. Now, this is where it gets tricky. You've all experienced storms where, depends how you wanna put it, but basically, Mother Nature wins, right? You get two inches of ice coming down, you're in deep trouble. You are not going to achieve any sort of level of service that you might state somewhere, which means you have to have in your official documents something that says, you know, these level of service goals are for typical winter storms and you probably need to get legal counsel to tell you how you express your reservations on that, saying, you know, when it all goes to hell in a handbasket, no, we're not going to achieve these levels of service, but we will attempt to get back to them as quickly as we possibly can. So um, that's what we're trying to do. Now, where does salt come into all of this? Well, if our level of service is based on rapid achievement of bare pavement, we will use more salt than if it's saying, hey, we'll get to it in maybe 36 hours. If we can allow more time and settle for less bare pavement, like in this photograph here, we can go with just bare wheel tracks, we will need less salt. And a challenge for every community is to figure out how important is the bare paper. Now we've run into issues here, and these are not technical issues. These are very, very human issues. To get around, it may not matter that you have bare pavement curb to curb. In the photo here, we clearly don't, but we can still get around. But if people expect to see bare pavement curb to curb, they're not gonna think that road is good enough. Even though from a driving point of view, it may be just fine. And from a safety point of view, it may be just fine. So the question for any community is how confident are you that you can make it stick? It's all well and good for me to say to you, you should do away with your bare pavement policy and you should say bare wheel tracks are good enough. But when the snow hits the pavement and you start getting those calls from citizens saying, 
hey, why haven't you dealt with the road yet? Can you be confident that you will be able to say, you know what, we have a new level of service. We talked about this, we involved everybody in the process. That road is perfectly safe to drive on. Suck it up, buttercup. You may of course choose a slightly more um, polite way of saying it, but it's still the issue, you've got to make it stick. Otherwise, it's, it's not happening, okay? So yes, we can change our level of service. And yes, I can tell you, oh, you should change it to this, that, or the other. But you, not me, know whether or not it will work in your community. And that's a very important constraint on any changes that might come up here. What if we are to say, okay, we're gonna change or maybe we're not gonna change. There are still other things we can do to save salt. We can focus on the bond, not the snow or the ice. Our job when we put salt on the road is not to melt snow or ice, it's to break or ideally to prevent the formation of a bond between the snow and the pavement, which means being proactive, getting a layer down prior to the storm beginning, when the weather allows us to, is awesome. It's great. Then the snow never sticks to the road. Our biggest snow removal tool is the plow. If the snow doesn't stick to the road, the plow gets much more of it off. So proactive helps us in that regard. There's an increasing understanding that using liquids and using less liquids than we would if we were putting dry material down is awesome. Uh, studies up in Wisconsin, for example, have shown that by using liquids, in comparison with very proactive measures they were using anyway, when they switched over to liquid only, not using solid salt at all, but only using salt brine, they were able to reduce their total salt usage over a winter by 50%. That's a huge saving. We can vary our application rates according to the storm. When the pavement is warm above 30 degrees, we need a lot less salt than when the pavement is cold around about 15 degrees. If we are always putting down the same amount, hey, we put down 400 pounds a lane mile, whether it needs it or not, we're putting down too much. And final step, measure what you do and calibrate your, your spreaders. The measure thing is really important because you all know you cannot manage what you do not measure. Now, Jason is gonna get into some of these things. Um, so you'll hear more about all of those, but let me wrap up now and, and say, level of service is central. We've got to make sure they're appropriate for our community. Having said that, it's not easy to change them. Different levels of service for different road types, different for our residentials than for our major commuter routes. Those are good practice. We've got to make them stick, not only with the public, but also with our own operators. They have to understand that when we've got to the level of service, we have done what we need to do. And finally, we can use a whole range of strategies to minimize our salt application, regardless of whatever level of service we've used. And um, that's going to be a big part of how we manage our chloride use going forward. So with that, I think I'm done. I'm gonna stop my sharing, uh, turn us back over to Mayor Burns. Mayor Burns, let's see if we've had any questions coming. Well, I, I think we, we have actually. In fact, I know we have. I thought the, the presentation was fantastic. I've got two quick awesome. questions and rapid sure. fire for you. Okay, Dr. Nixon, first and foremost, is your road the first road that's plowed when a storm arrives? No, it's not. Okay. I wish. <laughs> And, and, and you shared with us in the uh, green room prior to the call, you have a storm coming in tonight. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that storm will arrive in Illinois tomorrow night. Well, it might be early tomorrow morning, actually. Yeah. Oh, God help yeah. us. All. So, <laughs> and when's the last time you actually uh, 
hung out and drove with a snow plower? Oh, I haven't done that for a few years. Right? I, I, I've had the chance to go in a, a snow plow during a winter storm. If you haven't, it's amazing. do that. It's amazing. awesome. And it's awesome. every time, um, you know, there are annual uh, conferences oh, well, yeah. for the last few years, but I always hop into the cabs and I'm always amazed by this information coming at the operators and you're thinking, boy, you, you, you need a, a heads up display and all that stuff. Oh, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? It is. It's it incredible. is. It really is. Yeah. And thank you again for your presentation, Dr. Nixon. Appreciate sure. it. Sure. And now we get to turn over to a, a good friend of ours and perhaps closer to Chicagoland, our friend mm -hmm. Jason Pauling from the village of Carroll Stream. Jason, welcome. Kevin, this yes, is I'm sorry. Can I? Can I interrupt you for some questions? Of yeah, absolutely. And then, I don't know if we're going to take them right now or at the end. So go ahead. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and uh, just for clarity and and all, let's take a couple of questions if we could. So, um, and I, these are some good ones from uh, Marcella Bondi Keenan from Oak Park. Right, um, Stephen, they might be for you. They might be for uh, for Wilf. Um, but Marcella's question is for municipalities without a water body that they're without a water body and without a combined and with a combined sewer system, what policy levers would um, apply to uh, regarding salt? <clears throat> Marcella, if I misstated that, please feel free to, to come on mic and camera and clarify that. But yeah, so I, I think I think that um, it, so th if they're in a combined system, so they're not going to have a the MPDS um, permit for the separate sewer system. So they're going to be falling under um, probably under the uh, time limited water quality standard, uh, which we're going to be referring to, I believe that Oak Park, in fact, falls into that group. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that would be the regulatory lever that they would they would fall under. And Hannah will be talking about that that program, which is a, a kind of a it, it, it's a uh, well, I don't want to use the the wrong terminology for it, but it, it brought chlorides into focus in a regulatory sense for a lot of the communities. Um, in the, the uh, um, sort of the southern area of Chicago in the Dis Plains watershed. Um, so it would be the one that, that, it, would, that it would fall under. Um, and second question from Marcella, um, and I think this one is for you, Wilf, is um, do you have any recommendations for increasing public accept acceptance of a changed level of service? Um, I, I wish I had a magic wand. Um, I don't. I, I think it's it's just got to be public engagement. You've you've got to uh, find a way of getting the public in, involved in this, talking about the whole thing. Having taken a look, first of all, you know, you might say, well, instead of having our residential streets being bad pavement curb to curb, we'd like to look if we could leave them as bare wheel tracks, for example. So you've got something to present to people, get the data behind it, there's, there's good information out there, and then start the public meetings and start the discussions and use all the tools that you have at your disposal. It's, it's um, you know, your social media, your newsletters, your letters to the public in general, um, chat sessions, so on and so forth. It's, it doesn't mean you're gonna have everybody happy and, and Marcella, I'm sure you know that much more than me, but um, you know, I, I do think, yes, and I would say absolutely a webinar with a public engagement specialist. Um, I had the pleasure of working with a few folk from Texas um, who were looking at public engagement and they, they have some really good ideas and so, um, I will get you links or information, contact info on those folks. So uh, I'll do that. Thank you, Marcella. Really good question. I hope I, I gave you some ideas anyway. And Marcella, if I could chime in here, I think Dr. Nixon and Edith and everyone else would agree, just as important as it is to engage the public, the reality is engaging your policymakers on yes. why this is important is equally, because we all think we're doing the right thing. We all think we're uh, subscribing to policies that make a difference. And the moment those phone calls come in, it's like, oh God. So <laughs> your point, Dr. Nixon, sticking to it is tough. No pun intended. Yeah. 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 And I have one more question. It's not in the, um, the chat, but this is from me and probably for uh, Stephen. 
Stephen, on one of the graphs that you showed, there's a, you know, in, in terms of the chloride accumulation, um, and really since the new, new policies or new standards um, were put into place, and since the DuPage, uh, River Salt, <laughs> DuPage Salt Creek, your group uh, was formed, are we improving? Are we improving? And I know there's a lot of outreach and um, education and best practices. It was very difficult to tell um, if at least the rates of chloride um, in the environment are improving or the amount of salt that we're using. Yeah, so you know, this is a, a <laughs> we actually just are wrapping up a study looking, looking at this because it's a very complex um, item. You know, you've got this, um, I, I actually, uh, Wolf and I've talked about this several times, this kind of winter severity yeah. issue where, you, you know, you, well, to a certain degree, it's air temperatures, pavement temperatures, um, you know, uh, the amount of snow inches, but also very important is the type of precipitation. Is it snow? Is it ice? Ice demands a lot more compound be used than, than snow. So no two winters are the same. So when you try to measure, you know, uh, you know, I can look at the water quality and go, well, is it getting better or is it not getting better? But that doesn't necessarily tell us if we're being more efficient because we're trying to compare it to a storm that didn't happen. Um, so, the, the general trend is that for sure we are seeing dropping concentrations during the winter and for the most part during the summer. So that is the principal driver of regulations and, and aquatic life. However, there is also some signs that the total amount of salt that we're using is actually creeping up a little bit, even though we've had communities slash the amount of salt that they're using. Sometimes like Carol, like Jason will talk about, they've done it, you know, cut, you know, in half in some cases. And the reason behind that seems to be is that there's just winter weather is pushing us to use more salt, even as we're coming more efficient in the face of it. So that's a complicated answer to a simple question, but it is a complex issue. So I, that's why my question and answer slide, I said, we're, we're making qualified progress because yes, we're dropping concentrations, but we need to, you know, we're going to need to examine this um, more, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to rethink this as, I don't think we can meet the water quality standards the state has set, even the very high ones for Illinois, as long as we're using chlorides for winter de-icing. I, I don't think it's mathematically possible. Doesn't mean we can't do a lot better and of course save our own infrastructure from degradation, et cetera, at the same time. Anyway, that's up. I'll stop rambling. And Kevin, I think that's it for questions for now. That's so not, if That's you an want... interesting statement Stephen made. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all for the questions too. And keep those questions coming in the chat. We will address them as best we can, as quickly as we can. Uh, Jason, my apologies for the interruption. It's quite all right. We're glad you're with us. Street supervisor for the village of the beautiful village of Carroll Stream. Jason has been with the village of Carroll Stream for more than 16 years. And prior to that, worked for the Carroll Stream Park District. I believe you were the head golf coach. Is that correct, Jason? That is correct. Okay. Co-creator of the village's snow and ice removal plan that of course focuses on timely service and perhaps most importantly, while protecting waterways and infrastructure from chloride. He has a fire science degree from the College of DuPage. Were you also a firefighter at one time, Jason? I thought I was at one point. Did you? I, I stuck to the municipal side of just uh, doing public works. Well, pull out, put out the fire regarding chloride usage and we're glad to have you. Thank you, Mayor Burns. Uh, so yes, I'm Jason Pauling, Street Supervisor with the Village of Carroll Stream. Today I'm going to give you a brief overview of our operations, some of the things we're trying to do to reduce salt. Let's see here. Uh, just a quick facts about Carroll Stream. Uh, we have about 40,000 uh, population. Estimated we take care of 220 lane miles, approximately 300 quarts. We have an operational staff that is 28 employees. We do not have shifts, um, according to the CBA. We come in as one usually and leave as one. Uh, we have 16 routes that sometimes could be equally. Uh, employees may have two routes as part of that 16. We have 32 pieces of equipment. And thankfully, we do get contractor assistance in all our courts. So some of the things requiring attention is that we, we take real seriously is equipment, uh, the spreaders and the spreader controls. We recently went to all computerized controls in all our trucks. Uh, back in the days, it used to be the two, uh, the one level and the one lever and the two knobs. Uh, we had gotten away from that because back in the days, we were just told to go make sure your route was uh, curb to curb water. And they didn't really care how much salt you used. So we upgraded with the salt controls with that. Um, 
we do take a lot of practice in the loading and unloading assault. Uh, it's cleaned up. We do a lot of housekeeping after a uh, storm, make sure all that salt residue that's out on the pad is put back into the dome. Um, and we do a unique thing where to make sure our equipment is running right, uh, our loading, unloading practice, we kind of took it up a notch the past couple of years. We are really big in anti-icing with the liquid production and application. Uh, we live and die by that. As long as it's the perfect temperature, we are consistently out uh, doing a lot of brining applications. There are times in our brining applications that we will do an 80-20 blend with an organic. Um, but one of the main things we really do hit home here is training. We train, train, and train some more. Um, as a member of the professional snow fighters, uh, Wilf is like a mentor to me. So we follow a lot of his trainings uh, through the APWA. We attend the snow conference. We will be doing it again this year in Pittsburgh. Uh, but it's continuously training. Every year, we basically go through, our, and it doesn't matter how many years of service you have with an employee, we want to look at ways where we want to teach everybody. And one of the big things, too, is monitoring. Are we, is the equipment doing what we want? And then most importantly, are the drivers following the plan that has been given? So another things we do is it, we brought to the past several years when I took over supervisor about eight years ago is we do brief a lot. Uh, you're going to get your best debriefing from the employees. Yes, I'm in a truck driving around, seeing everything that's going on. But I want to know, was my plan good? Did it work? What didn't work? I want to be uh, I want them to criticize me, too or come to me with suggestions, that goes a long way because then you get the employee buy-in. Uh, we're always trying new, uh, new things. Again, learning from our neighbors and other professionals by attending trainings, networking. Uh, we actually just had another municipality here last week, just hearing their operations and seeing ours. Uh, that social networking goes a long ways because they're maybe doing something that you never thought of and then you learn from them. Um, and then again, listen to the drivers. They're your frontline employees. Um, they know what they're doing. Uh, it starts, you know, in the, we see snow and ice 365 days a year in the public work sector. Uh, we're continuously training throughout the summer um, by attending trainings, but going through the equipment, making sure the equipment works. And obviously a good plan is not uh, run without communication. Uh, what I like to do is do a pre-storm meeting, tell the guys what's on my mind, what I'm seeing, um, and explain to them, why are we doing it that way? It gives them, so they don't go out and they're confused. When I say, okay, go out, you're gonna do 200 pounds per lane mile, make sure we go curb to curb. Um, and they understand why we're doing it like that. Sometimes they'll, uh, they'll see in the plan, they get a lot of nervous if they don't see instant gratification. Well, with salt conservation, you're gonna start not getting that instant gratification because you're lowering your materials. And another big thing is well, not only I'm communicating with your employees is the elected officials. Um, they see us out, they wave, but they really don't know the job. So one of the things we did is, I know you had mentioned it earlier, Mayor, is we do ride-alongs. We have the elected officials come with us and ride, do a shift, sometimes up to 16 hours. And that goes a long way with the employees. Um, and for all of us, they get to see what we're going through and the ever-changing scenarios as a storm can change as we're possibly seeing tomorrow from rain to freezing rain to heavy snow, but also communicating to the residents. Um, they love social media. They stand behind that. Uh, once we put out a social media post, they stand behind it and why isn't my street been plowed or, or my street has a dusting, why is that? They like to engage sometimes in the positive which i will say is like 99 percent, but then you always get that one percent that is just does not understand so the, very important for us to communicate which i'll show you in the end what some of the ways we do do it and businesses we on the street are conserving salt we normally put down between two to four hundred pounds per land mile depending we go off a chart uh weather that's all part of the planet attack but the businesses, you'll be driving down a street and we're located in the Astro Park. So we see a lot of uh, private sector and they will call it carpet bombing. They are literally putting down so much salt and you're, and as a driver, you're driving and you see that and you're like, okay, well, I'm trying to conserve salt on the street, but they can do whatever they want in the parking lots. Yes, I understand there's litigation, stuff like that. So we're trying to educate them. If we see it over salted, we have a pamphlet, we'll go visit them, um, especially like on-site salt storage. We had it where we called, we saw a couple businesses that allowed us on their property that were storing it, 
downstream or upstream to a catch basin. So they didn't have it covered. When it rained, it all ran down to the catch basin, right into our right -of We have a Klein Creek in town. So we want to make sure we communicate that. So for me, uh, game plan is always the number one key, various scenarios. Um, I look at it as, is it gonna be a rain snow event? Is it gonna start off as a rain? If that happens, then yes, we will not be anti-icing as it'll be just washed away, a waste of product. Uh, freezing rain. We know during a freezing rain event, we may use more salt. And we have that understanding that it's one of those things like, hey, we, we saved the past three storms. So we know we may have to up it for the freezing rain, especially if it's coming down at a high rate to keep up the roads and keep the roads safe. Or is it gonna be an all snow event? Those are probably the most best because you have an opportunity to get out to add ice. You can stay ahead of the storm. Depending on um, the pavement, you, can may let, you may let it be able to collect for a little bit. So then we look at all these decisions, but the best thing is knowing in advance what your strategies are to employ under these various scenarios um, is huge. I'll have uh, Excel sheets. I will type up six different plans and that will even change several times. But I always wanna have it in my back of book, what, which way I went ahead. Um, and then pre-storm, confirm the best approach and communicate to the plan to the staff. Um, for example, we're gonna hold off for a little bit. We're gonna let it build up due to, it's only gonna come down at a quarter inch to half inch an hour. We'll just let it build to about two inches and then we'll come in around two or three right before rush hour and, and make our attack. Um, so one of the big things obviously is calibration as Wilf explained earlier is we calibrate and calibrate often. Um, we wanna know how much salt is going to each truck and how do we know how much is getting dumped out of those trucks post storm? So here's an old school way we used to do it. Uh, this is before a loader scale. Uh, we had a wheelbarrow, we would scrape it up and uh, we would weigh it. And it was a grooving, it was a, it was a tough task and it took a lot out of the employees, but you know, by doing that, it got the buy-in from the employees of trying to save salt. They saw how much salt they was able to save that last storm. And it's kind of like a victory for them. So now is, um, we have a loader scale. Everything is getting uh, into the trucks is weighed in and we're able to know exactly how much salt was put in that truck. So that gives us a little buffer because all our trucks are computerized. They should have the ability to let us know the storm total, but to make sure your equipment's running properly, you wanna make sure those numbers line up. And if we start seeing a little discrepancy, we're gonna go back in, we're gonna drop test it. We're gonna see, was any, uh, especially after hydraulic fitting was changed, was any equipment done? Uh, was something wrong with the valving? So they dig into that. And that brings me to this. So this is our loop, loop link um, service that we use through our weight, our, our uh, loader scale. And basically it gives me a time frame when the truck was loaded, um, the weight, how much was put in that truck. And I have the truck number. So it goes down and I, this is just one quick uh, snippet of one storm. Um, and it gives me the ability to create a spreadsheet where I take how much was loaded. And this was a, just a salt run, thankfully. And by, so the employees will go in back after an event, they'll dump in the back. Then we scoop it up with the skid steer. We dump it into the front loader bucket. It's weighed and put back in the dome. And that's where we get the final number. Yes, it's a lot of work. Um, so we're looking at ways to improve that efficiency, but we wanna make sure we're putting down the exact amount that is given and giving our best with the salt conversation. So we are this coming fiscal year, we are getting a loader scale, a second loader scale, because what happens when we had a first storm, all our salt was uh, in the salt dome, it was perfectly inventoried and the loader scale went out. So then it had to go to the eyeball test for that one storm. And then you, it kind of defeats the purpose and you're like, okay, well, we had it all calibrated. We had it all, uh, inventoried in at that perfect granule amount, but now it's a little off. So we're making sure we up our, another loader with a loader scale. And we're also doing a skid steer scale because the skid steer goes to the dome, brings the product to our salt brine maker. So we wanna make sure we're collecting the accurate amount of data that's going to that salt brine maker. Now with newer technology, you can get the automated systems, the computers, but unfortunately with COVID, um, a lot of my plans that were pretty big I have been put back on the back burner and strategically placed out moving forward 
hopefully that we're since slowly coming out of this pandemic. But again, we're very big on anti-icing. As you can see on the right, uh, the Veritech unit is our, new, our newer unit, uh, does 3,600 gallons per an hour. Uh, wish I could do more. I know like there's other municipalities have the app, they can make it uh, when they're not here. Unfortunately, we do not have that. But Carol Stream, going back to the early 2000s, uh, started anti-icing and we started off with this horse trough. Uh, we call it the crusty machine. Uh, it literally, I want to speculate it made 100 gallons per an hour, 150 gallons per an hour, but we wanted to make sure we continuously uh, made the brine. So that was our first unit. Then we went up to Janesville, Wisconsin and purchased a dairy farm uh, stir. Uh, so that gave us an extra boost of making 500 gallons per an hour. So we took all this new tech, old, I'm sorry, old technology and we're like, let's make it better. And we got this Veritech unit in 2013. And I want to go bigger and better, obviously, but you have to be fiscally responsible. So we're taking the tools we have to make it work. Uh, three out of the five anti-ice units are pictured here that we deployed to apply treatment. Um, so through addition of equipment, uh, we are now up to five and reducing choke points in the production. For example, we would uh, we had brine routes for each truck. Uh, for example, truck 50, you would go take care of this zone, truck 88, you will go take care of the mains, and then another truck, you could take care of the courts. So we looked at it as a, a major flaw in our system. Like, okay, we have trucks going all over the place. They're going over almost the same streets. What can we do to make it better? So we looked into that, uh, we took mapping, and now we have the ability to do the town that used to be done two and a half to three days, we can now do the entire town in one full day. Now that's total equipment doesn't fail because it can. Um, Brian Productions made, make sure they're, they're, kept, they're kept up, but to have the ability to go from two to five days, to, I'm sorry, two and a half days to three days to one full day, our efficiency went through the roof. So now we have the ability to wait a little bit longer and follow the forecast and see where the trends go. Because two to three days, you're thinking it's going to snow, then it starts off as rain. You just brined it, basically half the town, and just wait, washed away all that brine. So, and also we upgraded our pumping system. Uh, we have a massive pump now that is, has the ability to fill these trucks. We went from 20 minutes to fill each truck down to three and a half minutes to about five, six minutes. So we increased the production there. Another thing we do in Carroll Stream is. Uh, we have to make sure we, we price where you apply the salt. It's always down the crown. We stress it. Um, we have computers now, or I'm sorry, we have cameras on the back of our trucks that show the spinner. Um, it gives the guys an ease of mind, um, the ladies and gents to get ease of mind of exactly where that salt is uh, falling. Because you know, at night, or especially during the day, if you don't see the salt, you're gonna raise up the spinner and you're gonna wanna throw it farther. And then, so we're looking at ways to uh, reduce the scatter. So we continuously plow, or um, at, we continuously plow, always plow down. That is your number one fighting source is the snow plow. To help us, we put down the salt right behind it at um, a small amount. It's a, we call it the trickle effect. It's a continuous salting at a low rate, just down the crown to keep that brine effective that, and prevent that binding that we originally put down a day before. Another thing is, which I'm ecstatic about. We're finally have plans this uh, May 1st, our fiscal year, we're gonna get a road watch weather system. So right now we have, we use DTN, uh, all our trucks are equipped with road watch temperature systems, but the DTN gives us um, their pavement temperature at a certain spot in Carroll Street. But that's all it does. I'm looking for the grit on the street, the traction, and by obtaining a road watch weather system, it's going to allow me to get so many more um, tools in my arsenal. And that's one of the things, along with the camera, so we can see live actions. So, but right now we use DTN. We see, okay, when did the storm start? It's going to start tomorrow. Let's to, use tomorrow as an example. It's going to start during the morning, possibly get sunny during the day. So we know that the pavement temperature is going to rise and we can reduce our salt on the cleanup. Um, is it the next day? Is it going to drop? And we've seen the past couple storms, the temperature is going to drop to 15, 10, five below. We want to make sure that we put down the accurate amount of salt. Um, and also our salt is uh, treated with uh, liquid uh, organic. So we make sure that we apply that. And we also apply the 
anti ice. We have it in all our trucks or the to pre wet all the systems. And we contend, unfortunately, right now we can only go up to 25 gallons per ton. We're really looking to put that outputs up to the 50s. We want to make it wetter, better, and get that uh, salt working on the street and reducing the less scatter. Some of the things, obviously, the past several years we didn't have the ability to do was uh, purchase new equipment. So we looked at ways in house. Uh, I was watching a Clear Road study and it was one of the slides from up north and it was uh, Minnesota. They had like chutes on the back of their truck. Well, I thought it would be a great idea. So I went to the mechanics. I kind of threw some ideas at them. I'm, I'm like, I'm looking for a chute for the salt to just come off and just lay a thin crown, not a nice thick crown right down the crown. Uh, so we came up with this little guy. We actually implement uh, about four to five more in our system. And as you can see, this is a return pass and we already could see the salt working. Um, again, less scatter, uses less salt, and it's already getting that melting process from the crown towards the curb line. This was uh, a great success story for us. Uh, it was just some of the very, one of the very few things that we have done, uh, looking at equipment, uh, changing it for the better. And this worked really well because this is also on the main routes where it, uh, it's 35 miles an hour. Well, he has, he has somewhat stay up with traffic, so he can keep it around 20, 25, and he's still putting that bead of salt down the crown. Something we started about three years ago, uh, we took the lead from listening to people up north, especially like Wisconsin, is an all-liquid application. Um, these can only be completed under certain conditions. Uh, this is basically salt brine, 80-20 mix, 80% uh, salt brine and 20 mix, 20% organic. Um, if the storm dictates it, we, we roll it out. Uh, this is, uh, we're still in the process of learning it, uh, when to deploy it, but it gets us to our achievable goal of Carroll Stream has to be curb to curb water before we leave here. That's our plan. And that's what we're asked by our elected officials, the residents, but then also we have to conserve salt. So we took a couple trucks that we had saw um, the first storm this year was using about 20 for was using about 20 tons per storm. And he had the mains it was one of the largest routes. He went out, and was able to use two tanks of this liquid application um, and reduce his salt use down to basically however much it was to make the brine. So it was five tons. So, I mean, right there, we saw 15 tons instantly saved. Now you have to tell the driver too, because he sees this and he gets all excited and it's, but it's still continuously snowing a little bit. So it's not getting down to that perfect curb to curb water. We came up with a slogan of trust the process. You just have to trust it. It's working. Um, it's something we preach to the police department here. They'll come in at shift change and be like, our streets are terrible. They're, they're slick, they're icy. Well, we've just, it's 15, negative 15 degrees. We applied as much salt as we could. We didn't want to over salt. Um, we do not use calcium chloride. That's one of the things we have not used in the past 10 years. And we have no aspiration of using it again. It's continuously, we want to use straight liquids with salt brine and we want to continue using the geo melt. Here's another picture of the application result. Um, these were all completed on a snowpack street. Well, I mean a snow covered street. So as you can see, the driver went through instant scrape right down to black pavement, our achievable goal. Um, so this is something that we're learning. We're buying new equipment. Uh, we're looking at specs of kind of going bigger with this because the results are there. We're seeing it. Unfortunately, in Chicago, this is only really well in the beginning of the season. And then right now towards the end of the season, uh, February, March, where the temperatures don't drop too cold. And that is coming up to my last one here is getting the message out. Um, so I know we had spoke earlier is a board meeting. First year, we have three new trustees. I presented our snow and ice plan to the board meeting so they understood. Um, and in that board meeting, I stressed salt conservation. And during the meeting, they're like, yeah, we need to reduce salt, but man, our streets are one of the best and we wanna to continue to leave uh, bear to bear or curb to curb water pavement. I like getting up in the morning knowing my street is completely clear. So it's kind of like, okay, I got to continue. I got to get on this. I have to tell them, we, no, we have to back up salt. Like it's coming. So we're trying to educate our board members. 
And then we go through social media. We like to put out the social media posts. The residents want to know what's going on. They feel ownership once they know what's going on. They, it's a pride moment for them. It eases them, I guess you could say too. So we try to explain everything through a, a, a social media post. Then we put on some safety things from NOAA, um, just keeping them in the loop. And it's my job too, as an operations supervisor, is to make sure everyone above me knows what's going on. So basically, I will text my superintendent of operations and my director, here's my plan. This is what we're currently doing. And it just doesn't stop there. It goes all the way up to the village manager's office. And the village manager's office takes that to the official, elected officials. So everyone is on the same plan of communication. Um, it goes, it's one of our core values. It's very big here. Is just communicate with your staff, communicate with the residents, communicate with the businesses, and communicate with your elected officials. And it just makes your plan solid. And that would be it. Mr. Pauling, thank you very much. That was that was really interesting. Edith, Cheryl, questions? We do have some questions yeah, specific so for Jason, and then we might circle yeah. back. Um, yeah, Jason, after. I have one quick question before we turn to the others. Uh, is it best practices, for example, in Geneva, when we plow our streets, we take it all and dump it in St. Charles? Is that a problem? Is that a... <laughs> Well, we try to take it to Bartlett, okay, Lendo Heights, Hanover Park. So, yeah, we just leave it at their intersections. <laughs> Sorry, you just go ahead. <laughs> all right. Just, it, it's all coming out now. Um, J Jason, specific for you, there was some uh, questions about the spreadsheet and the software you're using. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so, we purchased, yes. Yeah, so, we purchased, um, through loop scale. Uh, it's a conveyor, or I'm sorry, it's a, a loader that has a computerized in it. It has a internet service. And what happens is the employees go in there, they select their name, they select the truck they're loading. And then once they load it, it only allows them to load so many tons too. So the truck is not overloaded. He loads the truck, then the employee sends it, it's processed, and it sends it to me through a uh, through the internet, obviously, and then to a website that I go on and I have the ability to export it where I create my spreadsheets of all the storms. So it gives me accurate data, uh, current, how much salt we've been using. But again, I will always see it as, oh my gosh, we use 300 tons of salt and I'm like banging my head against the wall, but it'll always drop the next day once we dump all the trucks and see our saving, our salt reduction there. Kevin, you had a question about the for Jason about the cost um, yeah. of a loader. Yeah, Jason, approximately what the, what the, what is the cost of a scale on a loader like that? Ten thousand dollars, and then we pay six hundred dollars yearly for the um, for the internet fee. And and this is an interesting, well, probably not an interesting question. Um, our team, and I know most teams, provide a summary, a post storm summary, for mm -hmm. everyone's consumption. Does your post storm summary include salt used, pounds per mile, et cetera, or is it just more elementary? No, it's, it's I, I provide it. It does uh, miles driven, truck okay. driven by the employee, total amount of time that employee worked, wow. total amount of tons of salt used, total amount of organic use, total amount of uh, anti-ice used. And I compile that, I print it out and I hang it and everyone runs to it after a storm and be like, I only <laughs> use this much salt. So we've got the buy-in. And it's huge. And do you share that with electeds as well? Yes, it goes into the weekly report on Fridays. Oh, okay. And yeah. um, when is your TED talk? Because we'd like to attend. <laughs> uh, the TED talk is Sunday. <laughs> Sunday of the um, uh, it's doing the Snow and Ice Show conference. I think it's on a Sunday. Are so you I'll going? actually be doing yes. Well, yeah. hell, man, we're going. <laughs> we need to find money in the budget. We're gonna fly out. And see okay. <laughs> Where is the snow conference? It is in Pittsburgh this year. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, that's so cool, man. Let's make sure we get a recording of that. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I think I think the man Wolf. He's my mentor. He's been well, Dr. guiding Nixon, me you through want a recording of that. Oh, we will make sure you get a re recording. It's going to be good. Oh, that's so, um, and and we are going to uh, while we're in Pittsburgh, we're 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 setting up a watch on all their bridges to see which one falls next. Um, <laughs> you know, and you know, <laughs> It's like the ice breakout on the rivers in, in uh, Alaska. We'll do the same thing. Which bridge and, oh you know, can God. you predict when? And... Brutal. 
Brutal. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, Edith, or should we move on to our friend Hannah Miller? Let's uh, let's let Hannah talk, and then we'll, there's probably more. But let's open up the group for okay. discussion after um, after Hannah talks. Watershed Project Manager, the Conservation Foundation. Our next guest is Hannah Miller. Uh, Hannah works on chloride and water quality and coordinates the Chicago Area Waterways Chloride Work Group. Hannah previously worked in stormwater management for a local government in North Carolina, and she has a bachelor's degree in geosciences from Hamilton College. She lives in the shadow of Brookfield Zoo and keeps a house full of animals as well, two dogs and a cat. Do you have a permit for that, Hannah? Uh, no, we fall under the amount you're allowed to have, so it's, okay. we're, we're good to go. There you go. <laughs> Ms. Miller, yeah. the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Mayor Burns. Really appreciate it. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the Time Limited Water Quality Standard, or the TLWQS, for chloride. Um, so this is sort of a kind of an up and coming new piece of information and new legislation that's kind of come out. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how it might affect some of your communities involved in this. Um, so just to kind of give you some uh, understanding of where we're talking about, we're talking about the south suburbs, southwest suburbs, and kind of the near west suburbs, including some of the city of Chicago as well. Um, so these are the watersheds that are impacted. They're the Chicago Area Waterway System watershed and the Lower Des Plaines watershed. So if you know that your community falls within this, especially pay attention because there'll be some really good information here for you and your community. Um, so kind of where this TLWQS came from for chloride is that the designated use for the cause was actually updated to support recreational uses in those waterways. Um, and that actually as part of that rulemaking process, the chloride standard changed um, from, uh, 1500 milligrams per liter during the winter um, down to 500 milligrams per liter all year round. Um, and so portions of the cost as we are maintaining public safety and encouraging safe and having safe public roads, they weren't going to be able to meet this updated chloride standard. Um, so over 48 part organizations participated in a joint submittal um, for watershed based variants. Now between that submittal and what we ended up with now is the TLWQS, there was some legislative changes that happened, which is how we ended up with the TLWQS. Um, but sort of these organizations that are involved are POTWs, MS4 and CSO communities, um, also including industrial dischargers, uh, transportation entities, especially like IDOT, um, and commercial salt storage facilities. Um, so just to kind of give you a little more information here, the uh, officially we got the Florida TLWQS uh, the Illinois Pollution Control Board issued the uh, chloride TLWQS in November 2021 um, for those portions of the cause and lower displays. The order is actually currently under US EPA review as of last week. Um, and so once it's approved, the Illinois IEPA will actually uh, issue permits related to the chloride TLWQS. The term is for 15 years with reevaluation every five years. The work group will actually be assisting with the reevaluation at that every five year point. Um, and it's also it's a watershed based approach to reducing chloride. There's going to be a lot of elements that are implemented at a watershed based level, not just in your own communities and implemented from that. Um, so each permittee that is covered under this chloride TLD because has some specific requirements that they need to meet. Um, so what is part of that? Um, the implementation is done. Uh, give me just a second here. Um, so each permittee that has specific requirements that they need to meet. Um, and so the goal is to help maintain public safety while reducing the excess salt use. So these dischargers are going to be implementing specific BMPs um, as part of their operations. But what I want to highlight with that is that these BMPs are actually already more, like, more than likely already part of your operations as what Jason was already talking about. There are a lot of these operations are including anti-icing or adding in um, ways to measure pavement temperature. So these are already measures and BMPs that are already very likely being used in your operations. Um, there you need to put together a PMP. Um, this is a pollutant minimization plan specific to chloride. Um, and so that's gonna be your planning document to sort of show what you're doing to help uh, it work closer to meeting that chloride water, water quality standard. Um, the two work groups, uh, the Chicago Area Waterways Chloride Work Group and the Lower Des Plaines Watershed Group are actually going to be assisting with this effort. Um, we're working on preparing a framework for our members and uh, petitioners to be using for this um, so that there's a good consistency across all of the members um, and all the petitioners as part of this. 
Um, if this is something that you are interested in participating in, um, like your community is part in within these watersheds, um, we're still working on figuring out what the process is going to look like for um, those who are not petitioners, who are not original petitioners, but want to be co get coverage under the chloride TLWQS. Um, and so what I want to highlight with that is that if you're not a, if you're not part of this and you're in these watersheds, just like what Stephen was saying previously in his presentation, um, this may affect development in your community, um, especially if you fall within that area. Um, and we definitely welcome any participation in the work group from those who are not petitioners. Um, it's a great way to have collaborative input um, across the region. So I wanna highlight some of these important milestones that the permittees that are covered under the chloride TLWQS are going to have to meet. Um, so within six months, those PMPs are going to be due. That's the pollutant minimization plan. And then you're also, as part of your own operations, going to establish a way to track the icing salt usage. Um, at 12 months, you'll need to implement those BMPs that are included in the chloride TLWQS um, and pursue it to your own individual PMPs. So this is within approval. This is these six month and 12 month milestones are within once the chloride TLWQS gets approved. Um, so we're waiting on the US EPA to go through that approval process. But once that happens, this, uh, so those timelines will start kicking off. Um, November 3rd, 30th of each year, you'll need to complete annual training, um, which is something I know Jason talked a lot about, um, is that training is a really important part of this process and getting that employee buy-in on making some of these changes if you're not already implementing some of these BMPs already in your community. Um, and then at July 1 of each year, you'll need to submit reports to both the work group and IEPA on your progress in implementing these BMPs and sort of the progress you're making towards reducing excess salt usage. One of the uh, things Anna, that, sure, uh, This ahead. is Edith, just interrupting us. I'd say it's a somewhat uh, urgent <laughs> question, and that is just, it's the communities that are in the audience are wondering, are they included? Um, Absolutely. So let, me, uh, let me jump back to my first slide here real fast. Uh, I know it's hard to see, but um, on the right side of the screen, that is actually the watershed for the chloride TLWQS area. Um, it includes both the lower portions of the lower displains and the Chicago Area Waterway System. So this does cover a large chunk of the south suburbs, the southwest suburbs, the near west suburbs, um, of, and, and a good chunk of the city of Chicago as well. Um, so to kind of give you some reference on this, it goes out to the um, Illinois-Indiana border um, and covers a good portion of the northern part of Will County and a good portion of the southern part of Cook County. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. Yep, sure thing. Um, and so the work group itself is actually, the work groups are both going to be providing specific assistance. Uh, I actually came from a meeting that we were discussing the PNP framework um, as to getting the uh, community's input on that because we want that document to be something that works for everyone and works for all of those who are actually gonna be the ones using it as their planning document. Um, so we're putting together uh, sort of various items like PMP framework, like the documentation template, um, regional training workshops, um, and annual reporting support to help support those communities and help support um, those participating in the chloride TLWQS. We want you to succeed and we want those communities that are implementing these items to have an to have the have a good way to get that success as they're going forward. Um, so we're also doing various outreach education and outreach to help get community buy-in so that there's the public buy-in on this as well, um, as they're going to be seeing some changes. They may be seeing changes to your operations and be wondering, hey, why haven't, why aren't you putting out as much salt as you used to be? So we are putting together those education outreach materials. Uh, the work groups are also uh, providing some assistance and participation in a development of a uh, parking lots and sidewalks winter training maintenance certification program for private contractors um, to help get that buy-in from the private contractors as well. Because I know that as you as, as our public works folks and our uh, elected officials are going to be seeing a lot of changes in your own operations. Um, it's good to see also get those changes in the uh, private contractors operations as well. Got the next slide here. Um, and so I just wanted to put up our contact information here for the various work groups so that if this is something that you are interested in and want to participate in, you have our contact information and are actually able to reach out to us. Again, if you're not sure if you're within that area and you wanna get that questions answered, we're happy to talk with you, happy to help answer your questions as well. Um, and thank you again. And 
please feel free to jump in with questions. I know I went quick. Um, it's a it's a lot of information to share very That's quickly. Great. It's great information. Do we have any additional questions for Hannah, Edith, or Cheryl on the chat? I know there was one request to put perhaps the link of the map in there. And mm -hmm. that is a heck of a territory you cover, Hannah. Holy moly. Uh, Mayor Burns, I have a question for Hannah. Hannah, we uh, we have a list of those communities that fall into that area. Can we give that perhaps to Edith and she could mail it out to everyone. Absolutely. Um, so the order itself actually has a full list of communities yes. that are listed as, as right. petitioners to the uh, to the variance itself, um, or not the variance, the chloride TLW. Yes, I've gotten used to the switch that switch that happened with that. Um, but we did get a full list of those petitioners, um, as well as uh, in the original petition, there was also a list of those communities that were eligible under that. Um, yes. And we'll make sure that we get that list as well out. Um, and again, if the, if you want to participate in the work groups and you are not yet a petitioner, please still reach out. We're always welcome to have you, um, have your input. Um, it's important to kind of get as much as input as we can as we keep working through this adaptive management process to build um, sort of our build the implementation up and have success with that. Hannah, I have, a, I have an unusual question, so forgive me for the lack of sophistication, but is it fair to say that areas like mine and others in the far western suburbs would likely mimic what's being done under your tutelage or is it something we should request be done because we find it valuable um so actually i'll I kind of let stephen talk about this as well a little bit but um a lot of other areas may have a fluoride tmdl which is a similar regulatory uh sort of method to do this but a lot of the work groups sort of take the uh, mentality of let's regulate ourselves before we need to be regulated. Okay. So yeah. participation in that work group can actually help mm -hmm. you um, sort of avoid having a lot of extra regulation on you as you make these changes on your own and be successful in that. But I'll let Stephen also talk about that too. Yeah, I, I, Thank you. Hannah has it. Um, I wouldn't recommend volunteering for the water quality standard. Um, you, you know, when we had the regulation come in that uh, Hannah referred to this, <sighs> Um, you, you know, one of our, we were trying to get there is like communities like Carol Stream, we wanted to give them as much time as we could to work through this, because this is not something you can do in two years or four years. As Jason was pointing out, you know, Carol Stream was working on this back in 2004. Um, uh, so we wanted to, you know, sort of act like a regulatory shield. Yeah, we're going to make progress on this, but understand that we're balancing road safety with environmental protection. Um, so your communities do fall under this time uh, or this TMDL, um, Carol Stream. In fact, uh, where Jason works, it also um, it does that. And it is a lot of the same, um, the same regulatory levers, but, it, but it, it's a little um, more forgiving in how it's being applied. So I, I would say, and what I would just say, suggest to communities, don't go looking to get regulated. Look at what Wilf was presenting with his level of service. Start to do that, then move into the stuff. Then that lines up the stuff for people like Jason to sort of go, okay, technically, how can I meet these levels of service the most efficiently? That way you're in the best position. I mean, what we would look in the long term is to go back to the regulatory authorities and say, look, we're running, you know, an operation that is say 90% as efficient as it could be. We don't need to be micromanaged. We need to think about how we can get these waterways into compliance in other ways, but we're doing the best we can with chloride. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think that we work on it quietly by ourselves. And uh, this, I don't mean to go on about this, but the state did try to put a time limited water quality standard into the area of DuPage, Park Lake and uh, Will County. And we argued successfully against it because we already had this TMDL in place. And folks like Jason were already making a lot of headway. So we, we said we don't need the extra regulation. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. And just want to let everybody know, I just quick dropped a link in the chat um, for information from the Lower Displains Watershed Group, um, whose website is, is fully up and running. Um, and so this includes a link to the map and links to the order itself, if that's something you're interested in looking through, um, as well as a summary document that our work groups put together um, about the requirements for individual petitioners for the chloride TLWQS. Excellent. So I have a question I'd like to ask, um, I guess, to the whole panel, and this is just to queue up um, opportunities for education, but Hannah, you also kind of hinted at um, a certification. So 
Um, I'm wondering if, if from any of the speakers, if you could give some advice to the municipalities on the call, what is the best way uh, to communicate professionalism and awareness um, about chloride use and, and uh, you know, sustainable salting and management to their constituents? And then Hannah also um, kind of teased up that there might be something coming for uh, the private sector. So opening that up to all of you to see if you want to give us some advice um, on how our communities can be prepared and let their let their constituents know that they are. Both. <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> I, I think one of the things you can do is is um, you know share through uh, webinars, for example, with your communities, and then. Um, start the process of educating your own workforce about this. And then uh, you've got to engage the commercial side around town. You know, a, a big issue, and it varies from place to place, but there are some estimates say that as much as 50% of the salt used on roads and sidewalks and parking lots comes from the private sector. Well, if we don't look at that, we're only looking at half of the problem. So we've got to figure out ways to engage them. I know already um, some counties have certification programs. I think that's a really good idea. Um, I know up in Minnesota, they do it. I'm working with folks in Iowa. We're putting one together for them. It's, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, although science is involved. And if you wish, you can use rockets, but um, you know, it, it, it's, it's getting the word out and um, training opportunities. My organization and many others do uh, one day trainings in the fall. And so th there are lots of options. And as we need more options, we can certainly make those available. Uh, and I know that Stephen, you do regular training, right? Yeah, we hold um, and uh, focused on chloride management. We hold um, three to five workshops every year, and now we're cooperating with Will County and Lake County to do those. And you know, they've moved to virtual because of um, uh, because of uh, the the COVID lockdowns. Um, but yeah, and so those were targeted on bringing awareness to communities about practices. We bring in outside experts, and we run them for public roads, which is one set of expertise, and then also for parking lots and sort of, um, you know, institution that's parking lot sidewalk management. The, 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 a lot of the science is the same, but the the, uh, the applications are a little different. So we run it for both of those. And yeah, those, we, we typically train about, uh, I think, well, somewhere, I think last year it was nearly 800 people passed through those workshops between all those communities. However, I, I would point out that we have not been very successful at getting the private sector into those. It's a lot of public or near public universities, school districts, et cetera, at the parking lots one. And that's, that's an area that everybody nationally is struggling with about how to get these small operators, not necessarily regulated, but get this to them. You know, are you being as efficient as you can be? There, there may be legislative approaches. They did something in New Hampshire to mm -hmm. allow the registration um, you know, if you got certified, you had a degree of immunity from um, uh, prosecution or, or being sued, basically, from liability. Sorry. <laughs> from the slip trips and falls, right? Exactly. exactly. Yes. Anyone else, Edith, anyone? We're at the bottom of the hour. Yeah, we are at the bottom of the hour. If anyone else has a question, please put it in the chat or go ahead and speak up um, right now, just as we're closing down. And I'm gonna to defer to you, Edith, with respect to our, our next meeting on March 15th, which is a cool topic regarding a circular economy. So you wanna watch that. In fact, we're just gonna use this same video and just recirculate it. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have, um, Three speakers that uh, will be looking at circular economy, um, including there's legislation that is proposed for an extended producer responsibility uh, for paper uh, and packaging products. So we'll be talking about that as well as um, the sharing US EPA's uh, strategies for a circular economy. And then we'll explore how to set up a commercial um, hauling franchise. So um, thank you to the, to the speakers. I think this has been a great topic and uh, I am really pleased with how it all came together. And thanks everyone for participating. 
Thanks, any last minute questions or comments from anyone? <clears throat> Otherwise, you're all free to go about your day. Uh, Jason, I'll be looking forward to you coming to plow the streets and my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Nixon, I'll see you in Iowa City. Hannah? Yep. Thank you for your good work. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been great. And McCracken, I love your accent, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, Steven gets credit for pulling the panel together with Steve and Dave Gordon. Yes, so thank you both. Job. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thank, thank you, you for having me. Yep. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Be safe with the weather changing. Thank you to all our professionals who keep us safe on the roads and elsewhere. To all of you who are committed to this topic. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good Thanks. one. Thank you.